started to should I do it myself? Good evening, friends. Uh, it's a pleasure to again stand up here and present 28th Wealth Vision Study. Uh, <clears throat> it's always a, what do you call, uh, it's a, a bit of tiredness and uh, uh, at the end of uh, two, three months of uh, the study, the insights are so many, you, get, you got to collect it and put it in paper. I think putting the paper is more difficult than actually doing the studies. So here we are, we have uh, somehow assembled everything and put together and uh, let me in this 40-50 slides, I will try to in the next 45 minutes uh, put before you what we have learned, what I have learned uh, about the markets and about investing. Uh, in, uh, so actually uh, this year's study is inspired by uh, a book called uh, Strategy Beyond Hockey Stick. So that's a book I read 5-6 months back. I said we'll convert this strategy book into a wealth creation study and uh, here we are. So, <clears throat> hockey stick returns, I mean, that's about hockey stick strategy and in the stock market everybody wants hockey stick return. Hockey stick returns means uh, a return of about uh, more than 25 percent for 10, 12, 15 years compounded and that gives you a hockey stick kind of formation when you draw a chart of your return, stock price. So, uh, what it takes to uh, get those kind of companies, those kind of returns, we'll talk about it. So, presentation is in three parts. Wealth creation findings between 18 and 23, uh, hockey stick returns, the power of economic profit, and market outlook. So, <clears throat> study methodology, concept of wealth creation is the process by which a company enhances market value of the capital interested to it by its shareholders. This is the biggest game in town and, uh, and the amount of wealth created worldwide are running into trillions. I mean, it's a hundred trillion dollar global market and uh, uh, yearly, if there is a 10% return in the global equity markets, it's about 10 trillion dollars of wealth being created. So it's the biggest game uh, and uh, in India, we create about 12 to 15% every year on a base of now 360 lakh crores. So if you do 12%, you're talking about 35 to 40 lakh crores of net wealth created every year. And uh, net wealth created is a change in the market cap over a study period of 2018 to 23, adjusted for corporate actions like equity dilutions, share buyback, etc. So total amount of wealth created in last five years is about by top index bidding companies, top 100 index bidding companies is about 70 lakh crores. So this number when we started in 2006, it was about 14 lakh crores. Now it has become 70 lakh crores. So this number is growing every year and then it takes a big leap. Like last year was a flat year in the index, so that's why it is 70 lakh crores. This year, it will see a huge jump. Maybe it will cross to maybe 100, 105 lakh crores, 110 lakh crores of wealth created in the next study. The pace of wealth creation is about 21% and the market has done about 12% compounded. So we have four categories, biggest wealth creator, fastest, most consistent, and all-round wealth creators. So the biggest wealth creating company is Reliance Industry in the last five years at 22% compounded. So it sounds that large companies cannot make money, but they have not only made sizable wealth, but they have also made at a pace of 22%, TCS 18%, ICICI Bank 26%, Infosys 20%, Bharti Airtel 16%. This has made a comeback after a long time. Hindustan Unilever, State Bank, Bajaj Finance. So these are top companies uh, at the average rate of about 21% and they have literally made 50% of all the wealth created by top 100 companies. The fastest companies, I mean, these are all lucky strike. <coughs> Lloyd Metals grown at about 80% compounded. Adani Enterprises, Tube Investment. So all these uh, fast wealth creating companies, they come from various corporate actions and some kind of a even lucky strike in uh, some resource allocation and things like that. So uh, these are the companies which uh, uh, we, we may not be knowing five years back this company can ever make it. Then you have the most consistent wealth creators, 
So Capri Global is five out of five years. Warren Brothers is five out of five years. They have outperformed in five out of five years. Then you have Tube Investment, Linde, uh, Adani Power, JB Chemical, SRF. They have done four out of five years. They have outperformed. <clears throat> All round wealth creating companies. If you look at biggest, fastest, and consistent ranks, Adani Enterprises stand out at at uh, the the fastest or largest uh, all round wealth creators then varun breveges adani pair like that the list goes on among the industries which have wealth created that is technology it has been the biggest wealth creator in last 5 years at 14 lakh crores out of 70 lakh crores 20% has come from technology and uh, i mean look at the share of profit last column and share of wealth created is just the same whereas the consumer and retail they have created 17% of wealth, second biggest, and their profit share is just about 7%. Banking, finance, third category. So these three itself have done about 50% of the wealth creation in the market of technology, consumer, and banking. And then oil and gas led by Reliance. So these are large ones. Telecom has made a comeback. Cement and auto, they have taken a very low back seat. I'm quite sure as the time passes, these company, these segments starting from here, and then reality, Reality is literally nothing. I mean, neither they have made money nor they have uh, uh, been featured in the wealth creation, but it's a very large segment. In China, 30% of GDP is reality. Now, I think uh, the change in the trend, this particular thing tells me that this is bound to rise as we go forward. We have seen in the first six, seven months, but as we go forward, I think reality will assert and this segment will become bigger wealth creator than what it is right now. I think this is a very <coughs> interesting chart we have been producing every year. In 2005-06, PSUs used to be 45-50% of wealth being created by all the listed PSUs. This 120 odd PSUs are listed and they used to create 50% of all the wealth. Uh, it became zero last year. In 22, there was no wealth being created, meaningful wealth by any of the company. You cannot have more contrarian kind of a chart like this and then this year, it has gone to, this is 22, 23, so this is 23. 6% of wealth is created by PSUs, and if you do the same number today, it might turn out to be 10 or 11%. So I think there's a clear turnaround in the fortunes of uh, uh, PSUs, to some extent by better management, and uh, in, uh, in, uh, in some measure, uh, uh, the outlook also changing, and since private sector have been taken to a different heights altogether, I think this is high time that PSU is also re-rated from the depth of uh, pessimism. <clears throat> the valuations have, I mean, more changes we have seen over the studies in the wealth creation. Uh, so earlier what used to happen till about 2014-15, low PE companies, they used to give us the highest return. Today, if you see, there is lowest, actually, lowest P has given the lowest return. This is a change of the marketplace. Till 2015, it used to be less than 5, less than 10 P multiples would give, say, 20% uh, is the average return, it will be more like 35, 40%. And then as the P multiple used to rise, the return used to go down. Now, 25 to 30 P, which is almost like a very high P kind of a grade, that has given the highest return. So, uh, so I think this is a changing landscape of the market. Look at the price to book. The cheapest price to book, companies are not given the biggest return. It is price to book 5 to 6, that has done better than the price to book 1 or 2. Price to sales, same story. Payback ratio, which used to be our proprietary ratio, is somewhat better, but this is with the foresight of the 5 years of profit growth. So that is somewhat better, but still not telling the full story. The only ratio which is still working well is the peg ratio. So if you have forecast of the 4-5 four, years of earnings growth, and if you can buy it less than one peg, if the growth rate is uh, something like 40 percent and you can buy a 20 p multiple i think like that but nobody can ever have a clear understanding of uh, growth rate for next five years but if you had the perfect foresight then you could get the returns which is uh, at least for uh, uh, less than one uh, less than one peg you are getting 29 percent but otherwise market is extremely well adjusted for the growth so market has done its numbers and uh, it doesn't leave much for the growth companies to be capitalized by people like us. The list of wealth destroyers. The, <coughs> this well, Vodafone is 140,000 crores. So total wealth destruction during this period is about 17 lakh crores. 
and uh, of that a lot of it is coming from the financial sectors i think 2020 covid and all the elimination of yes bank india board housing uh, all of them they have uh, been even two insurance companies general insurance and new india they also have been contributed to the well destruction so <clears throat> can i have some water so you know uh, coming to the hockeystick returns the power of economic profit so this is a book i was talking about uh, this is a book on strategy i think i found even for understanding strategy and looking at a company i think this is a, a very good book to read and uh, i would uh, uh, i would recommend that people should buy this book and uh, read it it's a 250 pages book but uh, worth the effort so what is hockeystick returns sharp sustained rise in stock prices so 60% 65% kind of growth i mean these are the best of the lot i mean we we are talking about hockeystick return anything for 10 years has given 25% uh, compounded growth rate so what happens is at some point of time the the rise because of the base it becomes a hockeystick kind of a formation so whether it is a tata lxc srf bajaj finance astral PI Industries, Ratnamani Metals, these are the companies, I mean, when you look at the numbers, they look crazy. I mean, hockey stick, what causes this hockey stick return? And even I was a bit surprised that uh, the profit growth is at about maybe 25, 30, 35 percent. But the P rating year after year is more like 20, 29, 30, 23, 23, 12, 26. So, re rating of the profit, sorry, re rating of the stock, the P multiple re rating is stunning so if you see the p for uh, tata lxc in 2013 the stock was around 19p today it is at 100p srf from 4 to 42 10 to 62 14 to 85 so i mean the these businesses these companies were not unknown or broadly ignored by the market in 2013 and that p the pay, the price at which they were available and when they delivered the earnings growth so the double engine kind of a thing where earnings growth is there and P re rating is happening. The pace of re rating, I mean, this can happen only in India probably. I mean, nowhere in the world this kind of thing is possible. Uh, and we are going to see more of it as we go forward. So con conventionally, earnings implies accounting profit. We suggest economic profit as a superior metric. This book suggests that uh, uh, the, the performance of the companies should be measured not in terms of accounting profit or net profit it should be measured in terms of economic profit what is economic profit what is the difference the main difference between economic profit and uh, accounting profit is uh, very simple see all the costs are homogeneous for all the companies in all over the world for when you talk about net profit but one problem is it doesn't consider the level of net worth or equity used to earn that particular profit so the only difference, I mean, in the current accounting, I would say deficiency, is that how much equity you use to earn that profit is not being charged. It's not being equalized for that. So I'll give an example. Economic profit is equal to account, accounting profit minus equity charge because you're not charged for the equity. And somebody uses little equity, somebody uses a lot of equity. So equity charge is net worth uh, uh, or co net worth into cost of equity. That is 10% in our case. So we charge... Uh, economic uh, uh, the cost of uh, the capital charge is at 10 percent of net worth so ep is equal to a uh, profit net profit minus 10 percent of the net worth so uh, by example in uh, ioc's pat in 2023 the ioc had a pat of 9800 crores so that was a net profit and nestle had 2400 crores net worth used by nestle is 2,500 crores, whereas Indian oil's net worth was 1,40,700 crores. So ROE is 96%, here it is 7%. The year end market cap is 1,89,000, it is 1,10,000 crores. But P is 79,11. What explains this difference is this, that Nestle makes EP, whereas actually IOC makes an economic loss. So accounting profit is whatever, 2,400, 9,800, net worth is whatever, Cost of equity is 
equity charge is 250 crores for Nestle and 13,000 crores, 13, 14,000 crores for Indian oil. So actually, Nestle is, has an economic profit of 2,000 crores, whereas Indian oil has economic loss of about 4,000 crores. And that explains that, uh, so whenever ROE of any company is less than 10%, though it is profitable and it shows a lot of profit, that doesn't mean that they're actually earning profit. They're actually not an aggregate basis. I'm just making loosely that they are not making true profit. This is, it is accounting profit, but the equity uses so much that uh, if you charge for the equity, they have actually not made any value addition to the equity given to them. So economic profit as a superior metric to accounting profit as it captures the true profitability of the company after charging for uh, economic cost of equity. Portfolio comprising only economic profit companies. So we said, let's prove it. I mean, let's figure out what does the market do? Because it is new for me, probably it is new for the market also. So does, it, does the market behave in different fashion than the way we are looking at it? And here, this slide is looking slightly busy, but, <coughs> but this is a, every year, all the 500 companies, you see the first column, it is a 500 companies return, S&P 500 return for every year. Then you have the return for 500 companies. We said, let's look at the companies in 2013 with the economic profit. So about 300 companies were with the economic profit and all those companies with economic profit. In 2014, uh, it had a return of 20, 25% in the first column against 18% of the market. So it had an outperformance of 7%. Like that in 15, 34% of the uh, uh, market return 72% was the, for the entire bucket of 300 companies. So outperforming was 39%. Like that, in the lower, the second column you see, uh, blue one, economic profit, 7%, 39%, 8%, 13%, 4%, then two years of underperformance. Then again, three years of outperformance, 22, five and zero. So if you look at the compounded return, you come to the extreme right, there you see that 8% is the average outperformance just by buying bucket of companies with economic profit and 6% uh, compounded CAGR outperformance. But if you are buying companies without economic profit, in that case, actually you are making only 2% outperformance or actually on a CAGR basis, 2% 2% loss. Actually 2% uh, loss uh, uh, through the entire thing. So the, uh, the economic profit companies, they clearly demonstrate 8 out of 10 years they have done very well, and on a CAGR basis, 8% outperformance. If you have 8% predictable outperformance in your portfolio, you know uh, how much money you can make, how much money you can manage, it's crazy. I mean, this, this, very, this is not sophisticated, this is very simple, uh, what you call classified. Just to prove the point, the companies with economic profit, they do far superior than companies without economic profit. Some more insights on EP. Study universe, we have put in five, this is what exactly this book is saying. You put 500 companies in uh, quintile of 100 companies each on a market cap basis. We computed the economic profit for all of them. We ranked them in order of EP and classified them to five quintiles of 100 companies each. Quintile one representing the top 100 and quintile five representing the bottom 500, bottom 100. This gives us the economic profit curve. I mean, this itself was a big kind of a learning for me that uh, the curve falls like this. Always this economic power curve will always be like this. So uh, when you make the chart for even net profit, it will always be concentrated at the top quintile. You look at the profit made by the top 100 companies. Out of, uh, out of say 100, 150,000 crores of economic profit, which is after charging for cost of equity, 1,40,000 crores is by the first quintile. 1,40,000 crores. Only 10,000 crores second quintile and 2,000 crores for third quintile. Fourth quintile is a loss of 4,000 crores and fifth quintile loss of 83,000 crores. So all the profit is in the first quintile. So he is saying, the, this book is saying, what should we do to get to the top quintile of the profit making? Because this book is about the strategy. He is saying strategy to get to the top quintile of profit. Everybody would like to be in top quintile. The money is at the extreme. Loss is also at the extreme. Profit is also at the extreme. And this power curve looks like this. So we have to find companies which are going to go to the top quintile. Somehow they end up in top quintile. That is a strategy for this. So what do we do? So we'll talk about that. 
so <clears throat> this is uh, company so those are five quintiles so this is the companies which move up the economic power curve generate healthy returns so when the quintile moves a company which is in quintile 4 a quintile 3 that goes to quintile 2 or quintile 1 basically you should end up in quintile 1 and that gives you from quintile 4 quintile 3 quintile 2 if you go to quintile 1 of course it's obvious that you you make a lot of money so 25 43 percent so like that we have that was for one one thing and this is for five five observations of 10 years each and here we find that it pays to be to end in quintile one or two you must start from anywhere but you must end up in quintile one or two or it pays to start don't start from four and five a lot of people they try to do from a loss making company or very marginal company you would like to reach the top it will never happen you have to start from the mid and we'll talk about that why you should start from the mid to reach to the top and when you are able to do that you'll realize that your profits are going to be upwards of 20 25 percent and depending on your luck and some of the ideas it could be 30 35 percent also so he has talked about the strategy to find these companies are 10 trend endowment and moves so these two three slides are really tough but th this is what is the core of the strategy to get to these companies so we are not telling you which company will do this particular move of quintile from three to one but we'll tell you the process by which the author is suggesting one can go and find ideas which will go from three or two to one so he's talking about trend i can tell you trend trend is all over the world in the sense that across the across the economic landscape across all the 500,000 companies there is always a trend and trend is i mean in technical terms trend is your friend let me tell you as an entrepreneur forget about as a uh, what you call a stock picker uh, trend is everything in in even entrepreneurship i, I can tell you in mutiya Vaswal, we have done everything possible in last 10 12 years between 2008 to 2010 we started four five businesses we i mean we did well also in some of them but all put together nothing much happens nothing much happened between 2008 to 2018 because capital market was very dull economy was somewhat economy was doing well uh, rather but capital markets were dull they were growing at four five percent there's uh, uh, the client additions were very muted all sorts of problems were there come 2018 and the trend changes and you see what is the power of the trend i mean our profits go by eight ten times in uh, two three years four years because now the economic trend the the participation by retail and the size of the capital market expansion is extremely rapid so trend is very important i mean i have seen companies after companies when the trend changes trend in the price cost volume whenever trend happens i mean we talk about so uh, the trends can have any definition uh, it trends are directional shifts in a broader economy various sectors technology consumer behavior etc uh, and these create opportunities for some businesses and threats for others when there is a trend positive for somebody they, it could also turn out to be negative for somebody so like environmental concern electric vehicles it can it can have a lot of impact on the ic vehicle companies uh, digitization food delivery quick commerce this can create challenges for restaurants mom and pop stores a lot of stores are getting challenged by the uh, this all this online uh, commerce ott players in the business it has impacted the uh, cinemas tv channels uh, uh, like uh, uh, migration from say public sector to private sector private sector have boomed and uh, public sector have lost market share they get they got marginalized in banking system so i think uh, the trend is very powerful i think once you get the trend then we have to figure out uh, so we have given examples of uh, what all can happen technological advancement that's one of the major source of big trend and big shift in business outcomes uh, rise of ai i don't know this is a very new one how exactly it is going to impact uh, and it's early days to say anything consumer preferences rise of private banking uh, user industry demand rise in steel and cement demand for real estate boom regulatory concerns government subsidy on evs i mean all these things can i mean we can keep going on and this is only just an example of 10 12 uh, broad trends there can be many more trends uh, which can really uh, there are trends which are there can be very micro trends concerning only two or three uh, businesses uh, but you have to spot the trend second so impact of trend any trend will have two impacts fundamentally 
there are only two impacts of the trend. One is value migration. Uh, the trend leads to value migration. So value inflow into benefit sector and outflow from a, a losing sector. Uh, so like uh, change in customer preference, banking, state-owned banks to private banks, telecom from fixed line to wireless, uh, gems and jewelry from unorganized to organized, uh, unorganized jewelry market to organized jewelry uh, companies like Titan and a uh, whole lot of other companies. Change in complete landscape like aviation from full service airlines to complete discount you see that in last 15 years, rise of, uh, uh, rise of uh, Indigo. I mean, it's an amazing rise. 60% market share in just 12, 15 years. So these are the value migration examples. So either the change will create a value migration opportunity or value creation opportunity, like Google, Facebook, Indian chemical sectors. A lot of companies are creating. They are not benefiting from somebody else's business, but they are creating brand new businesses ground up. So, so that's the that's the trend part of it. Then comes the endowment. Endowment is from where you start. The company, what the company has, whether it is a ownership uh, ownership uh, group, quality of management, size of revenue, competitive production capacity, and I think one of the most important is the competitive edge. When the companies start small, whether they are hundred crore company, two hundred company, the companies have that expertise. You know. Uh, the firm could be small, but the expertise could be very large. So when you have a competitive edge, when you find the companies with a competitive edge and uh, a good management group, then you have the market share, you have the brand. A lot of small companies also have good brands. So from where you are starting, that is very important. Then the next is moves. So you have the trend, you have the starting point. Then what the company does, when the tailwind starts, like now in the capital market there is a tailwind. So what the company does to harness you have the funnel, but how do you expand the funnel more so that you can get more and more of the wind into your, uh, into your bucket? So, <clears throat> so moves, corporate moves are the very important thing. Look at uh, like the four or five ways of corporate uh, uh, moves are pragmatic M&A, dynamic reallocation of resources, strong captive, uh, capital expenditure, strength of productive program, improvement in differentiation, and change in management. A lot of companies, when they change the management, the fortunes change. So some of the examples like Ultratech, you see methodically how they have built up by doing uh, four, five, six uh, big moves of m and going from 51 million tons to 127 million tons in last, uh, uh, last uh, eight, 10 years. So this is, this is a perfect example of very good m and equation and expanding your... Uh, now the cement boom comes. Dynamic reallocation, Agen, Angel One, it was an old booking house like ours, but they have changed to completely digital and they have put full bet onto uh, their uh, digital future. And you see what exactly is happening. Uh, strong capital expenditure, Bal Krishna tires, again, export story of uh, 2000 2001. It is the most expensive tire company because they have been building up their capital base, the capacity, and catering to the client and getting global market share. Uh, productive product, TVS Suzuki, we used to call it two and half kind of a two-wheeler company, half two-wheeler company, because they never could get more than five, six percent EBITDA. Today, they are at 11, 12 percent. I think this is an amazing achievement of capital productivity change in the last five, seven years. <clears throat> then Polycab, see the way they are building the brand, I think now it has become the most expensive company in the segment. From They came from kind of behind and rode right through and is come on right on top of that particular industry segment. This is a classic case of in five years how you can ride the power curve. Britannia and more recently CG Power changed the management from uh, Thapas to Murugappa Group and uh, of course they were, they were lucky the capital capex cycle also changed but from nowhere now they are one of the I think eight, ten, uh, seven, eight billion dollar company and still counting. So combination of TEM drives the EP growth. I mean, the, when you have the endowment, trend, endowment, and the corporate action, that leads to your economic profit growth. Once economic profit growth is there, you need to buy, you need to buy them at reasonable price. So, how can, so you need hockey stick valuations, and that comes from uh, buying, uh, buying the stocks below 20p. There is no science of uh, at what P multiple you can buy, but if you go by the past history of these companies, 54 companies which did more than 25% compounded, 70% uh, of them were uh, below 
below 20 p. I mean, starting from 4 5 p multiples, we seen uh, it was uh, as as much as so. Average is about 14 p multiple, and median is about 12 p multiple. So you have to buy very very reasonably priced. There is no science to say whether you should buy at 7 p multiple or 14 p multiple or 20 p multiple. I would say you must also look at the p multiple of the market. Maybe in 2013 p multiple was 15. Today market p multiple is more like 22. So I would say that anything below 22 is a, I mean, other things being equal, uh, 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 being taken care of, any multiple below 22 or which is again more like 20 is a good multiple to start with. Because you have to look at for the provisioning for the uh, for the re-rating to happen because uh, the single engine uh, single engine of only earnings growth will not be sufficient to give you a multi beggar you need the benefit of the uh, benefit the earnings growth as well as the uh, multiple growth so this is all 54 uh, multi baggers or hockey stick companies in last 10 years so coming to uh, market outlook. I mean, today markets are at a level where uh, it is very interesting to see. I have never felt more, I mean, that is scary also. I mean, when you feel so confident from within, typically what is going to happen is just the other way around. So, but <coughs> the markets have been kind of on long term basis very bullish or uh, has been growing at about 12-14% but this time we we'll look at market outlook in earnings data, valuation pointers, demand supply, large, mid versus small cap and what is my market view looking at all this data. So earnings data, so corporate profit to GDP which is a broad number which used to be at about 2%, uh, 2.57% 2 in 2003 when it laid the foundation for the biggest bull run, it went from 2.7 to 5.1 in 2008. That was the peak of corporate earnings. And then from there it started declining. And incidentally, in 2000, around COVID time, it again made a bottom at about 2.3% corporate profit GDP. And that has again shot up to 4% now. And right now, corporate profits are growing at about 15-17%, whereas the nominal GDP is growing at about 10%. So this number is still climbing upward. Second, expected higher trajectory of a long bull run. So here, till about 2020, you see the stagnation in the uh, stagnation in the uh, Nifty EPS growth. And now, from 2022, uh, from 2021 at 542, it shot up to 727. Current year was somewhat slow, 806. 22, 23-24. 23, 24, uh, the, uh, this current year, it is expected to go up from 806 to 997, maybe 1000 bucks. So this particular, uh, this is the year in which it will go from 806 to 997, which is more like 20, 22% kind of growth. And I spoke to my uh, head of research, he still thinks that this number will come. Typically, they, after half year, they, they, are, they used to bring it down. So uh, they are quite confident about 1000 rupees this year and 1140, 1150 next year. So we are into a very strong, uh, what you call, earnings growth season. And uh, valuation pointers are market cap to GDP, which is broad one again, is at 120%. Like uh, our GDP is 300 lakh crores and market cap has crossed today, I'm sure today it has crossed 360 lakh crores. So we are at 1.21, I would say, and uh, which is a I would say good level, I mean it's a bullish level and a lot of pessimism is already done and a lot of optimism is already captured. So at 1.2 times uh, GDP, I think we are at fairly valued I would say and uh, the only uh, severe I would say is the earnings growth which is at about 15 to 20 percent. Then you have the, <coughs> what is the long term range of Nifty P? Long term range is about 22 uh, last 10 years is about 22 average and we are at 22 so we are kind of a fully done up in terms of P multiple uh, earnings to bond yield is uh, average is about 0.69 uh, higher the better but now it, we are at uh, 0.62 it, th that also means that you are at a fair value 
what is the demand? I think the real change is the FI and DI activity. And this is the thing which is driving the market. And that's what makes me, uh, uh, makes me think that we might be, uh, we are in different kind of a bull market this time. So, uh, so what is happening is FI behavior is unpredictable as usual. But DI is broadly predictable. So what is happening, the DI is buying continuously, particularly after 2020, they are buying uh, 12 billion they bought and now then they bought 32 billion and current year till date they bought 22 billion and the activity is picking up. So they are buying because uh, there is a massive rise of retail, we'll talk about it, but FIs, they, I mean, they have also been more or less buying except for in 22, they sold 17 billion dollars and now in the current year they are making it up but they sold at about 17, 18,000 and now they are coming at about 2,000, uh, uh, 20,000 uh, or uh, 21,000. So this is what is the real difference this time compared to other times in the last 20 years. So what is happening is there is a almost two and a half to three million retail account, demer accounts are opened up and that has shot up the total participation from 40 million in 2020 to 133 million as of November end. And this, this, this two and a half, three million is continuing. And I think there's a lot of Jews even today. Uh, my sense is we are headed for 250 million accounts in next four to five years. So the base of the market, I don't know where it will stop. When it stops, we'll see when it stops. But right now, the influx from the retail side is happening. So what is happening is because market performance is there, the guys who are in the market, they are allocating more and the new guys are coming 100,000 per month, per day, sorry, per day. So this is a very, look at the performance of the uh, average daily turnover of the retail segment of the market from literally nothing, maybe 2-3 lakhs, 5 lakhs initially, now it is about 140 lakh crores per day of the retail turnover is there and it is still climbing very rapidly. So. So I think the uh, DI activity, uh, DI's uh, 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 flow is coming in SIPs and in very predictable form, but FIs remain unpredictable. But when they also want to buy, then what happens? So there are demand is coming from FI, DI and retail. So retail and DI both are buying because DI is nothing but retail flow. So DI and retail are buying, FIs also have turned buyers. So this entire thing is buying, the sellers are companies, either they are diluting for the follow-on equities or they are, uh, they are, they are unlisted companies are coming listed, so IPOs are happening uh, uh, and follow-on offerings are happening. And promoters are having great time. Promoters are selling blocks left, right and center. So the supply, so 50% of the market is uh, demand side and 50% market, percent of the market is on supply side. So I think we have enough supply in the pipeline, so don't worry. I think markets, if it tries to do unreasonable things, I think enough supply will come. So I think it will keep the market uh, expanding and uh, I hope markets don't go out of sync. So mid, large, mid and small caps. So this is a 10 year chart of all the three indices. So typically uh, till 2020, somehow aage piche karke, they used to merge and uh, their returns used to be like 20 year return even today is 15% compounded for all the three indices if you do 20 years. But if you do 10 years, what has happened is that now large cap is at 326, 3.26 times, mid cap is at 4.4 times and small cap is at 5.59 times. This is what is the, what has happened. Now what it does is that when you do a ratio between mid cap and large cap, just to draw uh, uh, some kind of a, what has been the past behavior, future can always be different. So here we have seen that the ratio used to be about 1.6, 1.7x and at the peak it was 2, now it is 2.1, 2.2. So clearly mid cap has gone little off the chart. The ratio needs to be corrected. Now ratio will get corrected two ways. One is either mid cap falls or large cap goes up. Quite possible large cap may do better in, as the FIs come in next 10-15 months. Even today, if you see today's move, large cap did better than small cap. So this can be a trend where uh, Ratio needs to be corrected for sure. I mean, these things, they do work, it takes time, but they will definitely get corrected. Uh, uh, in, in small caps, uh, luckily, despite so much of move, small cap is still at a, about 0.61 or 0.62 uh, 
of the large cap. So excesses are not as high as mid cap, but there also now we are uh, getting into a range which is kind of a little more expensive. So my sense is at market cap to GDP of 120%, we are fairly valued. At nominal GDP growth rate of 10%, Nifty EPS is likely to grow at about 15%. Very strong predictable retail participation will play a major role in market behavior. And the best is yet to come because this flow is very predictable and if by chance FIs also decide to buy, I think we are going to see a lot of action in the market. So conclusions, economic profit is a superior metric to accounting profit to understand true profitability of a company. Trend in demand and moves is a sound strategy for companies to move up the economic profit curve. This economic power curve is quite a sight. I mean, when I saw it first time, I couldn't believe it happens only in America, I thought. But when we drew the chart here, it is exactly like that uh, in India also. Successful TEM companies bought at reasonable price improve the chances of hockey stick returns. Mid and small caps are the favorite place to deliver hockey stick returns. After two decades of sustained decline, PU's, PSU stocks are on a comeback. For Indian equities, the best is yet to come. This is what I think. And uh, so my sense is, don't bet against India. Welcome to the bull market. Thank you.